Voldemort is now back. This is the first time he's appeared and he's assumed physical form. It's what the audiences have been waiting for. From the very beginning, there's always been a sense of something tremendously bad. <sighs> there was a real sense that the last three films and everything we've done in the fourth film, it's all building up to this confrontation with Voldemort. He's back! Voldemort's back! Ray Fiennes was our first choice, our, frankly, our only choice. He has in, the ability to inspire such fear with so little. He clearly had to be charismatic and be someone who had inspired many to follow him. He's outrageous and he's really frightening sometimes. He's really kind of mad and gone somewhere else in the eyes. One of the things that made me want to do the role was Mike Newell showing me these drawings, artwork, about the suggested looks of Voldemort. I got, I got a real buzz off it, and then that, that's pretty much when I thought, oh, this would be cool to do. They'd taken photographs of me and sort of morphed them into this frightening, reptilian-looking creature. The look is, is bald head and long, spindly fingers, sort of like a skeleton with skin on. Joe talked about uh, Voldemort as someone who has no sense of love. The good moral half of him is missing. That's sort of represented by his, in the book, by his becoming more snake-like. And the red eyes, it, it, I think, is a brilliant image in, a book, in the book, really successful. In a film, we ultimately felt, if you actually had red eyes, you couldn't read what the eyes were expressing. If you don't leave an enormous chunk of the human being there, then he isn't going to scare you. And then the hands come into the yeah, okay, into frame. Good, 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 good. Yeah. They come into frame. I think they could sort of snap. In his costume, what we wanted was a costume that wasn't necessarily as heavy and had a simplicity about it. He's just come out of this cauldron, so I think whatever he has should be akin to a skin. I started working on that idea, and that's how I came with those very thin silk, very floating, and we had a lot of layers of them. So. He was a sort of spirit. As filmmakers, on this picture, one of our hardest things has been taking a character who's been talked about so much but never seen and making him real. I began with the nature uh, of the character, and then it was much more a matter of how one would graft the expectations that people would have from the book. So the nose became very important. With the nose, we looked at prosthetic versions. When it was first discussed, I said, it isn't going to work. Whereas if you can just drop his flesh back, you know, take out that section digitally, it's going to be striking because it isn't something you can do with makeup. It's odd. It had to be terrifying, yet it had to be human-like, human-like plus snake-like. We digitally removed uh, his nose, or rather diminished his nose, flattened it like that of a snake, and instead of traditional human nostrils created slits. It came very clear that we had to, we were going to have to track, track his head and then track his expressions and then build and blend into his, uh, in, into his skin. So I had to wear funny little dots on my head, which they will use to digitally remaster my conk. Our goal was that you look at him and he seems quite normal, but then you look a little closer and you realize, you know what, it's not quite right. The way he is now is he's some dreadful, mutated human being. With an actor like Ray Fiennes, you Rest don't have you. the opportunity to do a 10-hour makeup. So we covered him in tattoos every day. They had to paint me with his transfer. They were laid on my face. They've got, and it's like the veins on his hands and on his arms and on his, on his head. They just add to the whole element of kind of fear and creepiness that goes with them. It's great. It's really good. I was very keen not to have to too much makeup on. I was very keen to be physically quite free to move. And I have some prosthetics up here to take out the eyebrows. But I wear nothing around my mouth or here in my neck or here. It's, it's curious how you feel it blocking expression when you wear all that stuff.
If you look at that sequence, he's putting a lot of himself into it. We never wanted to sort of steal away that. And you start building up too much of that, it really starts to lose that, that, that character. The glue that holds it together is what the actor actually feels. And if he feels comfortable and it feels right, then it probably is. I want to get my pad of my finger on his yeah, mark, okay. not the nail. Right, yeah. And I can only do so far bending my arm up. It was just very interesting working with him. I do feel I learned something, because what Rafe, the way he used his body, is fantastic. The idea is that he's just got this new skin, and Mike's great thing was he's new in this body. It's new to him, so he's testing it. So when he, he's, we first see him touching, feeling his head, feeling his face, his eyes pop open. And we see him test his whole, this whole new body for the first time. So it was a lot of just sort of feeling how the muscle might move, or what it's like to walk again, very much of the senses, and then and through the scene, sort of relishing the power. Hold out your arm, master. <laughs> the other arm, Wormtail. Mike was very keen to explore the unexpected mood swings of Voldemort. I said, pick it up! Get up! Get up! <laughs> You've been taught how to duel, I presume, yes? First, we bow to each other. So there are moments when sort of anger spits out at him at Harry, and other moments when it can be very silky and smooth and almost, almost pleasant. Uh, so you don't quite know when it's going to change and what it's going to do. <sighs> It's quite hard to play someone that is sort of, people say, oh, he is the sort of essence of evil. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. How's that, Mike? That's very good. That's very good. Voldemort has been the engine, you know, the, the evil force behind all of the books and all of the stories up to the point that he appears here. So that's a lot of weight on his shoulders. I wanted him to be really deeply, humanly evil not an idea of evil. I mean, and that comes from fear, frustration, unhappiness. <coughs> that a boy, Harry. Your parents would be proud. Especially your filthy muggle mother. <laughs> you don't know where he's coming from. I think when people are very scary when you don't know quite, when you suspect they might suddenly do something very violent. <laughs> You have to judge that, try and get it right. It's not too much, and yet if it's not forceful enough, it doesn't count. The scene with me and Voldemort was definitely the most challenging scene. At the same time as, as hating him with every fibre of his being, Harry is also absolutely terrified of him because he killed his parents and he wants to murder him for that. Hopefully, I get that fear right. You really have to focus, you know, mentally but also, it's, it's a really, it's very physical scene for, for sort of everyone in it, really. Actually, I felt bad, because he had to sort of be tied up without having many words to say, and I did a lot of talking. So he had to put up with a lot from me, <laughs> doing endless takes while he suffered. <laughs> How lies have fed your Do you know where you're standing? Do you know where you're standing? standing on the bones of my father. I've never seen anybody want to do a scene so many times over and over and stop with it and repeat it and change it and, you know, torture themselves to mine every last drop out of a scene. And I think because he's taken on board that there are millions of people around the world who have very strong ideas about who this character should be. I know there's one moment when um, I say to Harry, I'm going to destroy you. I say it very quietly. I wanted to say it very, very simply. After tonight, if they speak of you, they'll speak only of how you begged for death. <laughs> That's much more scary. It's a very disturbing scene. I mean, if you sort of strip away the fairy tale fantasy package of it, what you get is a little boy tied up while an older man humiliates him. And that, translated to the real world, is not children's fair at all. It would be foolish of us to coddle and make these films as though we were pandering to a young audience. If you pull your punches, then 
what happens is that you begin to oversimplify and sentimentalize. When I saw the first few days rushes, you know, with Rafe's performance, I realized what we'd gone and done. It holds my attention, I'll tell you, I'm nailed to the floor when, uh, when that scene is up there. I have to say, I didn't know much about the world of Harry Potter when Mike Newell approached me. But I um, talked to lots of nieces and nephews, and I quickly realized it was probably one of the best villain roles around at the moment. He's really quite terrifying. It's going to really freak people out. I'm really looking forward to that. It'd be great. Don't you turn your back on me, Harry Potter. I want you to look at me when I kill you. I want to see the lights leave your eyes. <laughs>